Hey, welcome to Non-Standard Models, where we ask big questions about the universe with theoretical physicists. Today, I'm here with Elisa Manjo. Hi. And Gustav Mogul. Hey. Elisa is a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, the Albert Einstein Institute. And Gustav is also a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck, as well as at Humboldt University in Berlin. Thank you for being with us. Thanks. Today, Elisa and Gustav are here to share with us their research on gravitational waves. When two massive objects like black holes or neutron stars come close to each other and merge, they produce gravitational waves that can be detected here on Earth. The LAG observatories in the US detected gravitational waves for the first time in 2015, about a century after their theoretical prediction. It was a huge success both for theoretical and experimental physics. Gustav, how do we describe gravitational waves? So we describe gravitational waves using general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. Now, before we had general relativity, uh, we had Newtonian gravity, in which case we think of objects as interacting via a gravitational force. But unfortunately, this has some limitations. It only works if the gravitational force is weak and these objects are slowly moving. Einstein's theory upgrades this by taking a different perspective, in which case we think of the gravitational force not so much as a force, but rather as distortions of the underlying space-time. And from this perspective, we have Einstein's equations, which tell us how matter and space-time interact with each other. Now, in order to describe gravitational waves, what we need to do is solve Einstein's equations. But in practice, this often turns out to be quite difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. But if we manage to solve these equations, what can we hope to learn by studying gravitational waves, Elisa? There is a lot that we can learn. In particular, gravitational waves um, tell us how gravity behaves uh, when uh, gravity is very strong, for example, close to black holes. And there are lots of uh, unexpected astrophysical phenomena that we can observe. Gravitational waves uh, carry a lot of information about the sources that generate them. So we want to listen what they are telling us. That's so interesting. What are gravitational waves? How can we learn about them? And what are they telling us? Let's find out. Perhaps we could start with a bit of a review. Gustav, what are gravitational waves? So gravitational waves are ripples in space-time. And a good analogy here might be throwing a rock into a pond where you see the ripples then coming away uh, from the point of contact. In this case, the pond is space-time and the ripples are the gravitational waves. And the more massive the source that you throw into the pond, uh, in this case the black holes or neutron stars, the more intense the waves are going to be. You just mentioned black holes and neutron stars, but what are these objects in detail? So black holes, as I'm sure you've heard about, are extremely massive objects um, where the gravity is so strong that even light ends up falling into them. And we can have pairs of these black holes called black hole binaries, which orbit each other. And as they come closer, they emit energy in the form of gravitational waves. So these tend to be the easiest kinds of gravitational waves to detect. But we can also have pairs of massive objects called neutron stars. And these neutron stars are collapsed stars whose mass is comparable to that of the Sun, but whose size tends to be compressed into radii of roughly um, uh, tens of kilometers. So by the time they arrive on Earth, these gravitational waves tend to be very weak. And could you remind us, Elisa, how exactly do we detect these waves if they're so weak? So gravitational waves, when they pass by, uh, they distort the space-time. And this means that uh, the distances change, even if this change is very tiny. Uh, so what we use uh, to measure uh, a gravitational wave are not uh, common rulers, uh, but we use lasers. In particular, we know uh, that uh, a laser beam uh, has a constant velocity and um, we can measure the time that the beam takes uh, from a point uh, to another one. In particular, uh, the LIGO interferometers uh, have four kilometer long tunnels uh, and uh, we use a technique called laser interferometry uh, to detect the gravitational waves. I see, but the LIGO detectors aren't the only one, right? There are a few different ones. I was wondering, what is the difference between them? Yeah, indeed, the LIGO detectors are not the only one. 
there is a, a Virgo detector in Italy, uh, close to Pisa, and uh, there is also a Kagura detector in Japan. And in the future, uh, we will also have uh, detectors uh, launched in space. For example, LISA um, is expected uh, to be um, active in uh, around 2035. But also we will have uh, on the uh, Earth the uh, Einstein telescope and the Cosmic Explorer. Uh, so all of these detectors uh, have different sensitivities and can detect gravitational waves in different frequency bands. Uh, so uh, we need all of them uh, to uh, make precise measurements uh, of gravitational wave sources. In the future, we can also detect gravitational waves from new sources, for example, uh, black holes orbiting around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So soon we will have more data and more detectors, but why it is important to detect gravitational waves from different sources, Gustav? Well, like any kind of wave, gravitational waves are characterized by three things. Their strength, their frequency, and their speed, which in this case is the speed of light. Now, just like how we can use light in order to learn something about the world around us by observing it, in the case of gravitational waves, we can use, something, use them to learn about the sources that emitted them the black holes and the neutron stars. So for example, uh, more massive black holes will give rise to lower frequency gravitational waves. In the future though, we hope to be able to make more nuanced observations about things like the spins of black holes and neutron stars, the event horizons of black holes, or the, um, the deformability of neutron stars. That's interesting, but does it mean that we can wait to orbiting black holes by measuring the gravitational waves produced by them? Absolutely, and we already are. That's really cool. Elisa, I've read that you're studying the presence of event horizon through gravitational waves. What does this mean exactly? Yeah, the event horizon of uh, a black hole uh, is a point uh, at which uh, light and matter cannot escape. Uh, so, um, there are also uh, some other theoretical objects uh, that are uh, as dense as a black hole, but do not have uh, an event horizon. And uh, we usually refer to them as exotic compact objects. It will be interesting to um, uh, predict the uh, signatures uh, of these objects into the uh, gravitational wave signals. Uh, and for that, we will need more precise uh, theoretical uh, predictions and understanding of exotic objects. But how do we make more precise predictions, Gustav? So in order to describe gravitational wave signals, we need to solve Einstein's equations. But this is very difficult. Uh, and in fact, in this case, we can't solve them exactly. So what we do is we split up into different teams and use different approximations to work on the different parts of the gravitational wave signal. I see. So what are the different parts of the signal? So the different parts of the signal are associated with the different stages of the merger event. First we have the end spiral, and this is what I work on. And here the two black holes or neutron stars orbit each other. And as they slowly approach each other, the frequency and the intensity of the gravitational waves increases. Eventually, we have a merger where the two fall towards each other and then they merge. And after that, we have the ring down phase, which actually then is what Elisa works on. Yeah, that's right. The ring down is uh, the final stage uh, of uh, a merger when a final remnant is formed. And uh, the final object doesn't have a perfect shape, uh, but it vibrates and it emits gravitational waves that uh, are dampened in time. It looks like a bell, uh, that rings loud and then the sound uh, becomes quieter. Okay, so to recap, we have the in spiral, the merger and the ring down. And our goal is to produce the signal for all these different stages. So starting from the in spiral, how do we obtain the waveform for this stage, Gustav? Well, for the in spiral, we do have one advantage, which is that at least early on, the gravitational force between our two black holes and neutron stars is still comparatively weak. So the approach that I use, therefore, is to start with a solution that we know uh, in Newtonian physics, where we can uh, exactly model these two bodies orbiting each other, and then build on it with successive layers of approximation. 
This means that what I'm doing is looking to solve a set of equations, but nevertheless, as these equations get so large, I still have to use uh, a computer. Unfortunately though, as our two black holes and, or neutron stars get closer together, the gravitational force between them is going to start getting much stronger. So at a certain point, uh, this method will break down and we'll have to look towards other approaches. So what about afterwards with the merger and the ring down? Because there we don't have any more two distinct bodies. So how do we model these stages, Elisa? For the merger, uh, we perform some numerical simulations, which are computationally expensive. And for the ring down, uh, we take as inputs uh, the parameters uh, from the spiral, like uh, mass and spin, as described by Gustav before. And uh, we can model uh, the ring down as a distortion uh, of uh, the um, spherical shape. And we can also look for new physics in the ring down stage. Right, you mentioned this at the beginning, but which kind of new physics are you looking for? Some um, quantum gravity effects could uh, occur and uh, prevent the formation of an event horizon in black holes. Uh, so uh, some exotic compact objects uh, could be formed. And in this case, um, is it doesn't happen anymore that um, the horizon uh, absorbs everything into the black hole, uh, but part of the radiation uh, can be emitted uh, back. And indeed, what we would see in the uh, ring down of gravitational wave signal is not only uh, the uh, ring down itself, but also an extra emission uh, of uh, an echo signal uh, due to the absence of an horizon in compact objects. Well, it's fascinating to study the different parts of the wave signal to learn more about our universe and what it's made of, and maybe even to find some signatures of new physics in these waves. Now, let's bring this episode to a ring down. Thank you, Elisa and Gustav, for coming today. Thank you. And thank you for watching. See you next time here on Non-Standard Models. Bye.